Hi, everyone. Um, happy VidCon. Welcome to Tackling Mental Health Online, but IRL here at VidCon. Um, I'm Lena Renzina. I run talent partnerships at the Ad Council. And today we have Mikey Murphy. Hey. <laughs> Elle Mills. <laughs> Hannah Hart. <laughs> Daniel Howell. <laughs> and Ow. Gabby Hannah. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, so I don't know how many of you have heard of the Ad Council, but quickly we are a nonprofit. We really focus on producing national social good campaigns for different causes. Um, and mental health awareness and suicide prevention is a huge campaign for us. I just want to tell you a little bit about that. And then I know you really want to hear from these guys. So super quick. If you have any questions, please tweet us at hashtag mental health VidCon 19 and we will get to those questions. But super quickly, um, sadly, suicide is like the second leading cause of death among young adults in the United States. And so that's why we're tackling this issue. I think really it's around not having conversations about mental health and a stigma. So that's what our campaign is really focusing on is starting conversations, recognizing when your friends are struggling, and then how do you reach out to your friends and really start those conversations. So that's what Seize the Awkward is all about. Just want to show you a quick video, um, and I'm sure you'll recognize some of the faces in this video. Listen, you're my friend. I noticed you haven't really been yourself recently. Yeah, I feel like something's up. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? I just want to know how you're feeling. And listen, even if you don't know what to say, I'm here to talk. No matter what you're going through, I just want you to know I'm here. I've got your back. When you want to talk, I'm here. So really the idea of talking about mental health can be awkward, but really we should all be leaning into those moments and starting conversations with our friends. So this year for Mental Health Awareness Month, we're really focusing on um, trying to communicate how to reach out to your friends, how to have the conversations. So um, we partnered with um, a few musicians, including Billie Eilish, um, to talk about her story. So a little bit about that, and then we want to hear from these guys. <laughs> is that you have to listen. You know, starting that conversation, you don't have to make it super serious right away. You know, you, you, you say, how are you feeling? Like, are you okay? That's what you, say, are you okay? Ask somebody. That's what they, you know, and yeah, I'm good. Really? Are you actually good? It's been like that for me. There have been certain people that have texted me right when I needed to be texted, you know, saying, they loved me and that they were thinking about me. And sometimes you don't even have to say anything to someone. Sometimes it's about a hug. <laughs> Obviously, I am not a trained professional in anything. I don't know what I'm doing, but I have seen it and I have I've been it. And it and it it really means a lot. So, um, Hannah, <laughs> yes. I feel Hi. like um, you've been super candid about your mental health journey um, since the beginning on both your channels and in your books and just on all, of your on all of your content. What really inspired you to share both like your family journey and your personal mental health story? Ah, yes, very good question, Lena. Um, hello, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with me, my name is Hannah Hart. Uh, I kind of fell into YouTube. Thank you, yes, let's clap. No, uh, <laughs> um, 
I started out online with a, a video I made for as a joke for a friend uh, called My Drunk Kitchen. Um, and so you might find it kind of ironic that I'm also a huge mental health advocate. Um, I, I suppose that the, the, the shortest answer is that um, I really had no choice because I couldn't see myself doing a career in entertainment um, without processing what was happening to me. And for me, I'm, I'm a verbal processor and by sharing my story and sharing my journey, it allowed me to process it better. Um, if for those of you who are really interested in this stuff, uh, my book, Buffering, Unshared Tales of a Life Fully Loaded, is all about mental health in America, about homelessness, um, about my family's experience with homelessness, psychosis, et cetera. Um, so if you, for a good time, call Buffering by Hannah Hart. Uh, so what inspired me was really just, I couldn't not talk about my reality with a platform that I had. I know what it looks like trying to struggle and struggling with mental health. I know what it looks like trying to maintain your mental health. Um, I know how expensive the medication journey can be. And so this is why it was something that I had to say. I really, I don't know a better answer than I had no choice. I like that. Um, if you wanna also, when, it, when I ask you a question, if you wanna talk about why mental health is important to you, um, but Gabby, why is mental health important to you? And also, I want you to talk about how you really use your music and your art to express yourself through your lyrics and your poetry and talk about um, your struggles with mental health. So talk a little bit about that and like, your like art journey and why you use that to express yourself. Sure, so mental health, mental health, mental health is important to me because it's something that I struggled with a lot growing up and didn't understand what it was. It was something that I thought was a very embarrassing thing to say that I was depressed or anxious. I didn't grow up in a household where we could really talk about our feelings or express things to each other. So there was just a lot of inner tor turmoil all the time for years from like 13 until like 25. I didn't understand that you could just talk about it. So then when I started doing YouTube, that kind of lifted a little bit and Vine and stuff just because I was distracted and it was fun, but distractions only last for so long. So once that kind of started to settle in and then I had to look at myself again, I was now dealing with the same demons I'd already had, but now I had all of these eyes looking at me and I had this channel where I was talking about my life and my feelings and then I'm also getting these messages from people like you saying that you're experiencing these things too and that was kind of the first time that I realized, oh, this is so common. Why was this so embarrassing for me growing up? And what if somebody could have said something to me growing up about that? So I just wanted to talk about it so that, I don't know, the way I was connecting to like, and as far as the music goes too, I was always listening to like My Chemical Romance and Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy and 30 Seconds to Mars. And I would just, <laughs> like, I was such an angsty teen, I would lock myself in my room, and I'd be like, my parents don't understand me, but Gerard does, and it, it just, <laughs> it meant the world to me. So, you know, through my Vine journey, through my YouTube journey, it just kind of got to a point where it's like, I was coming on camera and trying to shut off everything that I was feeling, so I'd be like, literally in between takes, like, <sighs> you know, having a panic attack and then being like, <laughs> and then this happened and it just wasn't authentic at all. So that was spilling into the rest of my life where I was just like this anxious ball of energy who was coming out towards with like rage, misplaced anger towards other people. And I just had to really face myself because everybody was looking at me. So for you guys, you probably don't have that experience, but I just hope that this is very long-winded, and I'm not even sure if I'm answering your question. No, it's all great. <laughs> but I just hope that you guys understand, because you're at that age that I was at, I think, demographic of VidCon. And it's so normal to feel this way. Like, all of us have felt this way. Way more people than that have felt this way. And try to find some type of creative outlet. Like, you guys know that's my whole thing. Like, make your tragedies a work of art. Whatever. Do that. And if you're not an artist, that's okay. That's how I do it. I like to write. If you don't know what your outlet is, ask somebody close to you. What is it that I'm the best at? What's your favorite thing about me? And if they say you're really kind, then take all of that energy and throw it into volunteering. If they say you're really smart, take all of that energy and try to make, you know, help help others with their schoolwork and just do something positive for other people. It doesn't have to be like I'm going to make a song. It can be just something that you're good at that you're taking all the negativity and making it something positive. And you didn't ask me that.
<laughs> it was good though. Confidence it was great. Energy I just started rambling when message. I'm nervous. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, I think what you talked about, about the eyeballs and like the pressure, obviously, of people watching your content and having to keep it very positive and not share those bad parts of your day. Um, but Elle, if you had a situation where, you know, you very publicly are going through something, a mental health situation or a journey um, like you did last year and you talked about it with your channel, talk a little bit about how that was like and making that amazing video um, that you came back with, but then also the taking a break, you know? Like, what's it like to take a break? Yeah, for sure. For the so for those who aren't familiar, um, I my channel really started to like blow up um, at end of 2017 and beginning of 2018. Um, and I was a huge YouTube fan growing up. I watched everyone on this couch. I uh, and I was a huge fan. So when all of these creators started reaching out to me and people started watching, it was like my dreams are coming true. And I was so scared I was gonna lose it. So I dedicated my whole life. To, to it and said yes to everything. And so I was you know, pumping out videos and I don't delegate, which is, th that's another problem, but. Um, and so I, I take control and then um, I, um, I, I'm not, I am nervous, but. Uh, um, and um, I, I went on tour, did, I was going, I was like never home and, and unlike, uh, unlike Gabby, I don't know, growing up I never really had like any mental health problems and so um, last year during tour, I experienced my first panic attack, and it was very scary. I was, I was alone, and and it just all started adding up. And I was ha by April last year, I was having like a panic attack every other day, and um, and then so I kind of just broke after I think a convention last year, and I had a very m public mental breakdown, um, and that's when like everyone, my friends and family, um, kind of just you know, like they decided to stop. And they're the ones who told me I need to take a break. And so we canceled everything. And it was like, it, that was hard for me because I felt like no one was going to watch. I felt like my, like everything I worked for was going to be taken away from me. And so I feel like that's a lot of, that's why there's a lot of YouTubers who are burnt out and stuff. Because they have that mentality that if they don't, people are not, are not going to care. And so, um, what was the question? Um, <laughs> Where was We're all going nervous. Nervous. Like to take oh, a break. Yeah, was just talking about the experience. Oh yeah, and then so yeah, and I made a video explaining my whole thing because part of me was like I made it very public. My men like the breakdown was pretty public, and I feel like people were like assuming things, and I wanted to like just tell my story, and also um, I I I just like I couldn't make another video without addressing it because I just couldn't like fake a smile. Like I was not happy, and so I wanted to get that across because I just, it would have felt really ingenuine to have done anything else. Um, and yeah, it, it was uh, it was hard at first because I'm someone who don't, doesn't really like talking about that stuff in person. Well, I'm better at it now, but like growing up I didn't. I just didn't like emotions and stuff. And so it's just like, it was like a, a whole 180 having, like going to, being on, being on stage here talking about it. And so um, it's been like a, this whole past year has just been like an adjusting period. And I've been like really, I went to, th I've been, gone to therapy and stuff and and it's uh it's it's been really great i think i've definitely grown a lot from it and it's been really cool to put my mental health first and i'm like so much better now hell yeah <laughs> um um daniel I just, you I, can i, I you just want to speak oh, to uh just really quick like a thank you l for doing that b like just hearing that when you got like a video that got some success and all the pressure that you felt to make sure that you kept you put your whole life into it there is a good side of that, which is that when faced with something, you go through the fear. And that, I think that if I had had that kind of attention, and that YouTube, if YouTube had been a space where people did things, luckily for me, it really wasn't that much at the time. Yeah. I think I would have run away. So like, it definitely broke you down, but it's also a huge strength. 100%. And I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you, thank yeah. you so much. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, I really would, I would like, everyone's like that. Um, Daniel, you went through something similar. I mean, you've been on YouTube for like 10 years. Don't, we're all dying. <laughs> He's 80. <laughs> I'm 500, um, yeah. But that's a lot of pressure to constantly, you know, mm. put out content. And I think earlier this year or a few months ago, you s sort of took a break as well because you were, you know, dealing with your mental health. So how did your audience who had been loyal with you for so long, you know, react to you taking a break? Well, and they were like, are you dead? <laughs> What up? Uh, and you know, it's that weird thing where mental health, the reason why it's so important, it's the whole concept that it's that invisible illness and the whole 
thing, especially with being a YouTuber and being public, or even just anything you know you could relate to your families and your friends, is you might not know at all that someone is going through something like this, which is why you have to ask and why you have to talk about these things. And it's got so much better in the last few years. It's one of these things where every year that goes on, it's just getting so much better and so much better. But even when I made my video about the depression that I've been through in 2018, it was like a really terrifying experience. But for me, it was that assumption that everyone was looking at me and I don't know what you thought about me or my life or whatever, but no one would have thought that I was having such a hard time until I spoke about it. And then when I did, that changed everything. So it's just that thing where everyone here, you have to communicate your feelings. I mean, I don't like communicating my feelings. <laughs> I think we all know it can be difficult and awkward, and you know that's, that's the entire idea. But it's so important to share these things, um, especially with my, my break, as it were. I think it comes back to what you were saying, which is when you're constantly being a YouTuber and it's, you're expected to keep doing something, it's quite hard, and what I felt was that Every time I uploaded a video, it's like I was putting a piece of me out there. And every time I kept doing it, especially with the gaming channel that me and Phil had that was very frequent, it's like I couldn't grow or change behind the scenes because every time I put something out there, it's like I was still froze in that version of myself that I was putting out. So it got to a point where I just said, there's certain things that I have to deal with in my life because like this is getting ridiculous now. So I made the you know, very scary decision to say, I'll upload this one video called Trying to Live My Truth. Literally, it's about being authentic and how sometimes you need to go through the really hard stuff to make a big difference in your life. And I said, I am not gonna come back until I'm ready to actually do this stuff because I can keep doing the same thing that I've been doing so long, like pushing it forward, kind of procrastinating my personal life by doing work, which is like a weird sounding thing, but it's very real. <laughs> But it, it was big, you know, and then again, it's one of those things where I come back after a year of not uploading, plot twist, I was a massive queer the whole time, um, which was, you know, <laughs> but it's, that's just, it's another example of, you know, it's like you don't know what's happening in someone's life unless you communicate these things and you can't keep it on the inside and it's difficult. It's so hard to start this conversation to tell people, especially when there's so much shame and stigma, you know, relationships with your family, the environments that you grow up in, it makes all these things so difficult to talk about, but that's why it's so important to do it. I, real Thank quick, you. just wanna say to you that your depression video, when you put it out, helped me so much, because that was before I was really talking about it that much, so seeing yours and being, you know, such a big YouTuber and such a platform, that was a great example of like, oh, that's what it can do to see somebody talk about it. Thank so you. that was meant a lot to me, and also your coming out video was, Fucking beautiful. I already tweeted you about it. But if you have not watched that Thanks. video, please go watch it. It is so beautifully done and well thought out. And please just go watch it. Okay. I mean, it took like a whole year to make, so it better be. <laughs> you know, I thought trying to live my truth when you uploaded that, I thought that was going to be your coming out video. But, uh... <laughs> well, it, that was the whole point. You know what I mean? It was me saying, like, I'm not ready to deal with certain things yet, but this is an issue in my life. And you know, sexuality was just one of those things. We're talking about mental health, personal relationships, sexuality, there's so many things. And especially as someone who's putting themselves out there personally on the internet, it's that whole thing where if you're not living your life as the person who you know you are on the inside, you will never feel right, so you have to. Yeah. So as hard as it was, as insane as the decision seemed to everyone in my life, I was like, no, I have to do this. And no matter how long it took, it took a long time. It was the right decision. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mikey, you made a video talking about sort of the anxiety and pressures of being very successful as a young person and needing to continue that. And like we're talking about, consistently put out content. Um, how do you balance that? And have, have you found any sort of like tips on how to avoid that burnout? I kind of want to hear that from everybody too, like tips on how to avoid burnout and... Burnout. Hey. <laughs> the big word. Um, I feel like I had like a little version of all everyone else's little breakdown that we just kind of went through. Um, I, this is the thing, I, I started making YouTube videos very young, I started at 11 years old. Um, and I was just making videos, watching Dan and Hannah, uh, and, and you know, as we, <laughs> As uh, I was I'm 11. So old. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was just watching videos and I really wanted to 
do it too, and so I started making videos myself and um, really kick-started my own channel when I was 13, and um, by the time I was, you know, 17 years old, I had a million subscribers, and I was like, what is going on? Um, and it's kind of like a version of what Elle kind of went through where, you know, I had so much happening to me, and, you know, I was achieving my dreams, but I don't think it was as much as I felt like I was going to lose it. I think it was more that I achieved my dreams and I still wasn't, like, totally happy um, because that really wasn't, like, what was going to make me happy. Um, it's interesting. The journey of everything is always, like, way more exciting than actually getting there, and that's, like, a really true statement that I've learned um, throughout my life so far, especially being in entertainment. Um, but when it comes down to, like, the burnout side of things, I ended up making the video that I did because I'm just, like, out of ideas, man. I am out of ideas, and I... I've done YouTube for a very long time, and I love YouTube, and it's given me everything that I have, but, you know, as I've started to work in, like, the more traditional space and, like, work on, like, you know, making television shows and writing movies and stuff like that, I have, like, unlimited ideas because it's such a freeing space where, like, taking your time is respected, <laughs> and... I get into this space and I've, I've been, I've grown with this mindset of like, you have to make something every single week. And I get into like this traditional space and they're like, yeah, we're gonna like work on like episodes one to three for the next two weeks and then we'll take a small break and then we'll come back on like episodes four to seven. And it's like, I could just, we could just write all 10 this week. What about that? What, 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 why don't we just do that? Cause it's like, I, I was built on this like craziness you know, make something all the time, always have an idea. The second I'm uploading the one thing, I'm already thinking about next week. And like, that's unhealthy. That's never been done in entertainment before. And uh, that's, that's what we're all doing here. And um, there's just certain aspects of YouTube that I think dro like drove me to that video, to make that video, to just be like, I don't want to edit something this week and I have no ideas this week. And this is something I really need to like talk about. Like you guys all said, talking about it really helps. Um, so I think that that was a big part of it was really just like, let me speak for a second, um, instead of, you know, putting out something that isn't authentic anymore, feeling trapped in that same version of myself every single week without growing at all. Um, so I guess I just took that one week to grow a little. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting, like, and maybe, um, I think that if anyone had thought that it would have this kind of cultural impact, no one would have said like, here's the standard. It's once a week. For the rest of your life. life. <laughs> ah! yeah. Which is that, and that's, honestly, guys, like, that's not sustainable. My hope for, like, the future generations of digital or independent content creators, if we could just call it independent, is that you get to, you have so many platforms and so many different ways to experience and interact and engage. The YouTube standard that was set during the generation that we came up in, I feel like it, that was the only option at the time. There well, it was also different content. It was a lot easier to edit because, you know, we didn't really know what we were doing. Well, I wasn't really there, but, like, it used to be, like, you the know. The quality jump, was, it was lower, yes. Cutting. It was just jump cutting. <laughs> yeah. And now it's, like, graphics, and we have to do something insane. Sound and, like, are we jumping lighting. off a helicopter today? And we didn't used to do that. <laughs> it's, like, even, like, uh, like, five, six years ago when I was making videos more frequently, what I did was scripted comedy, right? And it would take me two, three days to write a video. You can't even like say that you'll definitely come up with an idea once a week is the problem as well. And so there was like a brief period where I think for about four months I tried to upload a video once a week and I literally had a complete mental breakdown because I was like, this is impossible. But that's what the YouTube culture was making me feel because it was like I had always since the very beginning been that guy that is just the one that doesn't upload ever. So I thought I'm gonna try being a good YouTuber once. No. But it's that you get so many weird feelings of like, you feel guilty that you're not just doing as much as other people. You feel shame from people. Some people totally innocently might just be like, I really like you, can I have some new content? And then you go, ah, bleh, you know, internal screaming on the inside. So it's definitely, it was a very specific culture that kind of made all of the YouTube creators feel this pressure to do something so frequently. I think that's changing now though in a good way. Mikey, so. I love what you said about being stuck in the same version of yourself because that was my biggest thing was I, before I found out I was the monster that had been here all along, I had tried to keep up with, you know, I started YouTube when I was, I think, 23. So at 23, I was like, welcome back. I'm erratic and angry all the time. And then I had to stick up with that and it just wasn't me anymore. And what was the weirdest, uh, listen, 
if you listen to nothing else for the rest of your life, listen to this because I'm God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but seriously, the one thing that I've noticed and that I finally learned when I'm going through something horrible, I tell myself even in those moments now because I've trained my brain to do this because it's happened so many times is what beautiful thing is going to come out of this moment? So when I'm always at my lowest, it's always when everything takes a big turn and everything turns around. So in this case, it was after like the monster meme and people were tearing apart my music and then I was in a scandal and now I'm like, all of these things were happening and I was at an all time low and I was laying in bed on Tuesday night. I had never missed a Wednesday upload since I've started my channel. And I get really bad anxiety about missing uploads and deadlines and times. So I was laying in bed and I'm like sobbing in bed on a Tuesday night, like I don't know what to do. So then I walked out into my living room and it was a complete mess because I was in a very deep depression and hadn't cleaned. And I looked at my carpets and they were disgusting. And I texted my best friend and I said, cleaning my carpets for the first time in three years. And she said, that's actually so funny. So me fucking around being like, fuck YouTube, I don't care. I'm literally going to clean my carpet for a video revived my channel yeah. and now <laughs> I'm that's in the universe intervening exactly. like have a breakdown that what's that phrase it's like a breakdown is actually a breakthrough <gasps> you know what i mean that's Beautiful. not me being original oh, but it's, it's that thing where it's like you yeah. had to hit your lowest so you were forced to mm -hmm. actually change so whenever you like if anyone in this room ever feels like I'm about to lose it, and it's going to be drama. Maybe that's a good thing, you know, because sometimes be awesome. the pressure backs us all into a corner where we feel like, oh, there's going to be some confrontation, or I'm going to miss that deadline, or I'm going to fail at doing this thing. And sometimes that's just, you know, like your body's way of saying yeah. you have to confront this at some point, and then you'll grow from it. Mm -hmm. a, a little, like, oh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, okay. okay. Um, no, it's like when people say, like, life is a roller coaster. Like, you have your ups, you have your downs, and every down you're gonna come up at some point yeah. like you're gonna find something to be like oh like this is actually exciting there are good things in my life right now that I can you know focus on so I think like I mean this is what I always tell my friends that I talk to or tell myself when I need to is like when you do hit those really really bad lows because it does happen you're gonna hit those lows you just kind of got to get through them kind of take notes for a minute and be like okay what 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 am I feeling right now like what are some ways I can try to get through this better then when you go back to that high again and you feel better be like, okay, this is what I did last time. This kind of helped me get through that. Now I can carry this into this next low because I know what's going to happen. It just is a cycle. Um, and it's important to like, you know. But yeah. imagine if any of us had given up. That's what, guys, yeah. I'm preaching right now. But like, <laughs> imagine if any of us had like in our lowest lows been like, I almost quit YouTube so many times. But it's the people, the people that are sitting on this panel right here are the people who are like, this is awful, but I can't let them win. If you let them win, then they win and you're gone and everybody loses, really. But if you just stick with it and like go, like last year was the worst year of my life and this year is the best year of my life. Imagine if Same. I would have given up. That sucks, guys, don't, just don't give up. Um, and I, I promise Lena will get back to your really, I'm sure very <laughs> thoughtful questions. Uh, I just wanna say, just, just speak to like a little a point, counterpoint, a little bit of the opposite side of the experience is that, for so, so I've always been responsible for my family. Like I have to take care of my family. My mom's disabled, like that's my reality. And in that, man, I would love to have a nervous breakdown. No, I don't, obviously. I really would, but no, I don't, obviously. <laughs> but um, I think that like, for those of you who, you know, there's so much, when you have responsibility, like financial responsibility, that like other people's lives will literally not like Twitter suffer, like where's content, but like literally, like you won't be able to make their rent. Yeah. Um, you have to give yourself the support you need by taking the spaces in the intervals that you've needed it. Like I, I also wasn't a regular uploader and I think that that really saved me at a lot of different times. I see people that are like, I haven't posted a video in six weeks and I'm like, Oh shit, neither have I. <laughs> but then again, my channel's blah, 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 blah. But, um, but just for those of you that like, you know, you can, if you feel something coming, if you can see it in the distance, like you can take time now and like pause and slow down a little bit. You know, and nothing, nothing bad's gonna happen. You, you don't have to wait until it becomes unignorable, I guess. 
You know? And I like what you're saying about like the pressure for you to perform in that environment as well, because that's one of those situations where it might look like somebody's thriving because they're working really hard to keep something afloat, but then sometimes that's when people need support the most. Because I'm somebody, like, my family has no money, so it's like, if I destroyed my own career, I'd have nothing. So it's that constant terror of, if I do any mistakes with my career, then I'm going to go to absolutely zero. And it's kind of like that existential terror of, you know, feeling like, I, yeah, it's just me by myself. And it's that situation where you feel like you have to be so professional, you have to be so perfect, you have to do all the work, you have to, you know, just keep everything going. Because and if you, you stop for a second, you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. yeah. You know? Mm. So, you know, that's that thing where you might see a friend and you go, oh, look at them, they're getting straight A's, they're doing this, that, or the other, but don't presume ever that people are totally fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, you talked a little bit about covering and sort of hiding parts of yourself um, and how that really affects your mental health. I think um, LGBTQ people are at much higher risks for mental health issues, um, especially trans folks. But um, several of you identify as LGBTQ and have come out and talked to your, to your audience about that. How did that sort of affect your mental health journey? And then I think a lot of your audience and fans probably want to know, like, do you have any tips for them if they're struggling with their sexuality um, tied into them? Hannah, you look so scared right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, You're the expert on this, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like you, you've shared so much on your channels, too, so. I was actually thinking about L at that exact moment. Yeah, I was. Thinking I was about thinking, L. I was thinking about your coming out video and the way you did it. And yeah. I was thinking to myself, Honestly, when I started watching your stuff, I was like, shit, this is like an artist, man. Like, this is somebody who is an artist. Like, this is great work. I hope she never feels like she has to play in the YouTube game. And so then when you, when you, but, you know, you had your quote-unquote breakdown, um, which I'm sure, yes, it was. Uh, I was like, yeah, of course that just happened to this kid. Of course that just happened. Like, because what you do and the way you make your art is different from the way someone, the way anyone makes their art is different. You know, it's like you spend a long time working on an album or music and like you, you choose the creation and the distribution. Um, and so anyway, speaking back to coming out, um, I was really, I just loved it. I loved your coming out video. I loved the way you did it. I loved that it was like artful and just, it was beautiful to me. And you too, Dan, but you Thanks. know. It's so funny how like, and one of my favorite things about YouTube and people coming out is watching the different ways that people do it as well, because I think it's a really beautiful way to see the different kind of creators that people are. Like, yours was so extra in, like, such an on-brand way. What made you, you choose, like, yeah. And what? when I saw it, I was like, <laughs> When I do it, I'm going to be stood in front of a black wall talking <laughs> for 45. But, you know, it's just like that's, that's the different way that people do it. But I think that, that it resonates with the people that watch it as well. So I think that it's really helpful. Um, what was the question? I'll just, <laughs> just how did talk uh, about yeah, yeah um, just being an LGBTQ person, struggling with your mental health, any advice you have for your audience? But I think we all want to hear about your coming out video. It sounds like you yeah. want to talk about oh, it. Oh yeah, no, no. By the way, thank you. Um, that means a lot. Um, um, and um, yeah, no. I I was like when I first discovered like I was, like I had uh, attraction to girls too. Um, <laughs> I was in the middle of the YouTube thing. Um, and so I remember that's one that, that's the first time I experienced depression. Um, I was, I cried every night. I was so, I was so scared. I, I just remember crying every night being like, I just made my life so much harder. Um, and being really sad about that. And I, I just knew that everyone, I knew everyone would be okay with it. I just like, I don't know how to explain it. I come from, I come from a, like my home, I live in my hometown still. And so like, it's not that they're homophobic. I don't know. It's just like. Just now everybody knows. Yeah. It, I don't know. It's like weird. Like the way they talk about it, it's like, oh, that person's bi. Like, oh, it's like the gossip. It's you know what I mean? It's the mill there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like not common there it's still. And so that's was my thing. And I was very scared. And I actually came out, I came out to my family and friends through video. Um, and some of them were like, obviously wanted it half to know before everyone else, but I, I was too scared. And so um, I Wait, did your family find out with everyone else? Yeah. <gasps> and if they're in the video, then they found out during filming. But that, that, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, no, it was, I, I needed to do it. For me, video, my videos are very therapeutic. Um, and they're, they're my way of like, com like communicating my feelings. Monetize your pain. Yes. But really. Yeah, no, I'm joking. Yeah. I, I, 
it's a uh, it's interesting because and I, I I think it's also just a product of the social media environment in general is that everyone is forced to kind of label themselves and there's strength in labels and there's also like entrapment you know because we say LGBTQIA plus um, and I just hope that we get to us I hope we get to a point where we can just say queer because it doesn't matter to me if you're bi or pan or gay I just you queer great good to know you want to meet like ten people that I can introduce you to then <laughs> instead of just one you know but like. That's, that's the vibe, right? Is that like being a part of a queer community is empowering, but can also be entrapping if you feel like you have to segregate yourself from each other. And that was one of my biggest issues. When, uh, for me, like when I'm talking about what was the one issue holding you back from making this video? I'm like, do you want a list? Um, but that was, that was such a huge one because maybe I could have made a video in 2014, 15, and it would have just been half of what I made this time. But then when you know society started like talking about gender identity a bit, suddenly I had this moment where I was like, well, what the hell do I even feel anymore? I don't know how this things work. And especially when you like go on Twitter and Tumblr and see people just arguing so specifically about all these labels, it just made it so much more stressful. Where I was like, oh, I, got, I just want to come out of something so it's not this weird secret anymore. But then it felt all this stress. So if anyone else is feeling like that, I don't think you have to feel that stress. I think, as you say, like you can just come out as a cue. You can say something. You can change your mind. It doesn't matter. Formless <laughs> blob. What if people were just like, I think I like everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like houseplants, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, one of the interesting things that you mentioned briefly was like the, the fine line between saying the right thing to be helpful to people and talking about it, because you have to be careful, you know, especially when you talk about depression or anxiety, you don't want to stress people out. When you talk about experiences with sexuality, I felt like I had to be really careful not making the story too sad or stressful because you still want to give people hope. Because if you're asking about, you know, your relationship with your audience and talking about this, my big thing was, I don't want to whitewash what happened to me because I had a bad time, you know what I mean? And I felt like I had so much to explain that I really just had to tell like the whole gritty, real story of my life. But I was worried, like, I don't want to scare anyone off because, you know, like the moment you come out, your life instantly becomes a million times better. But at the same time, I didn't want to lie and say that it's all going to be fine because if anyone out there goes through something similar, I don't want them to feel, oh, well, things didn't go perfectly for me. It's like, no, everyone's life is a mess. Literally everybody's life is a mess. It's not just you. It's fine. <laughs> well, was Clapping that a good a message? Mess. We're all equally a mess. I don't know. Hey, guys, it's relatable. I don't know about equally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I'm sure we have some aspiring creators in the audience. Um, so what advice would you give to creators in the audience or out there um, when starting a channel and wanting to grow their audience and, and make content? How do you balance your mental health um, starting out to do that, especially in the YouTube age today and, and maybe not when you started? I don't know. I just would say, like, don't establish like a level you have to be at or like think that you're only a legitimate creator because you have so many followers or something. YouTube does this thing where they really like to hang the analytics in front of your face a lot. Like you go on your dashboard, it's like your last video did 29,000% less than this video because this video, and it's like the analytics just kind of get a little crazy and you don't want to like get too into that. So I mean, do it if you enjoy it. And if it starts to work out and you start to grow an audience from it, then find the happiness in that and find it as like an outlet to, you know, be creative and, and, you know, communicate if that is something that you need or if it is just fun for you, if you feel like you want to make videos because you want to make videos, then go ahead and do that. But I think don't set like a, a standard for yourself before you even start because it's just going to crush you. I was going to, because I think a huge thing is like c consistency when starting a channel is growing growing your audience is cons consistency <laughs> consistency <laughs> helps right and but um, I honestly think you should like it's gonna be trial and error to find the pace that works for you because I feel like you don't have to upload every week you there there's gonna be a pace that will work that will help you grow an audience but can also prioritize your mental health and so I feel like you know, it's just going to be figuring that out and trying out what works best for you and, uh, you know, seeing what your limit is. And then um, obviously, like, I don't know, for all of us, it took us a while to figure out what that what our boundaries are. And so I think there's going to be a bit of like a trial and error, but um, just finding out what your boundaries are is perfect. Uh, I guess I would say 
Focus on the creation, not the distribution. That's it. <laughs> nice. Put that on a mug. Yeah, right? Yeah, I, I think, like, at the end of the day, the priority is just do what you want to do because you love it. Don't feel like you're forced to do something because you're feeling under pressure or you want to do what other people want to do. Like, make... If you're a creative person, make what you want to make. Make it when you want to make it, how you want to make it. Because if you compromise anything to try and achieve something, you know, lots of YouTubers, they work and they work and they work and they finally make it and they're like, mental breakdown. So it's like, it's up to you, you know, it's a, and this is just in life generally. We all choose how hard we work, what we sacrifice to do that, and then at what point you just need to take a break and look after yourself and do what's right for you. So just, I'd say always do something because you love it. And then just always just remind yourself of where you're at and try not to work yourself into a corner. I would say make sure that it's actually something you want to do. Because I, I know that I, you've all probably seen the poll in the studies that says the number one job that kids are saying in school is that they want to be a YouTuber. But what I also see a lot of is when they say, well, what do you want to do on YouTube? A lot of kids say, I don't know. So it looks like what a lot of people are looking for right now is actually fame and attention as opposed to the career that is a YouTuber, which is constant public scrutiny. Sorry, I'm gonna give you the harsh reality of it. Constant public scrutiny, working 24 hour days, not taking a break, and kind of giving up a lot of other life opportunities to be a YouTuber because like for me, if I tried to get a real job, I couldn't. I've been technically unemployed for like seven years. Like I, I can't get a job. So really ask yourself, is this something I want to do? Do I have something that I actually want to contribute or is this just me looking for an audience? Because unfortunately we live in a society in 2019 and it's probably not going anywhere where we all desperately want to be seen and we're told that you are quantified your value as a person by the number of Instagram likes you get. And that is not true. So if you're only doing it because you think that getting more likes is going to make you more popular at school, if you're doing it because you think that it's gonna make you a better person, if you think that your worth is identified by what you're doing on YouTube, I would say don't do it. Do it because you have something you wanna create, because you have a message you wanna share, and because you believe that you can contribute to the world. Don't do it for fame and money because it will destroy you. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> On Until the <laughs> it will destroy you part. Yeah, but then that's yeah, important it will too. Yeah, I'm a very intense fine. person. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It was the truth. I mean, on top of what you said, like, the likes on Instagram are not going to make you cooler at school. Like, I, I was on YouTube actively making videos in high school and throughout parts of middle school. And, like, it did not make me cooler <laughs> at all. It made me much less cooler. So, if that's anything to take away from it. <laughs> it's just sad because in school... I. I, I don't think any of us can, well, you probably can. How old are you, Mikey? I just turned 21. Oh, you can too. You and I, we probably don't relate because in college, in high school, or sorry, high school, we didn't have like social media like that. So you guys are walking down the halls of school and it's like, <laughs> oh my God, did you know Elle only has like 20 followers on Instagram? And I can't even imagine that because we were, everything we did was subjective. Mm -hmm. So it was like, oh, you're ugly, you're stupid, you're fat, you're whatever. And now it's like, I'm 30,000 more followers better than you. And I just can't even imagine what you kids are going through and it kills me. But if you're hanging around people that only care about that stuff anyway, get out. It's not worth it. Like I've been in different situations. I've been in YouTube for years where it's, I'm hanging out with people who have a ton of followers and it's, it, now the people I hang out with aren't even on social media and I feel more loved and fulfilled. And I'm not bashing people on YouTube or social media, but the people who make me feel the most loved and now that I'm the happiest I've ever been, are people who don't care. And you shouldn't be around people that care about that stuff. So just be yourself and try to separate yourself as a performer. I think Bo Burnham said something about that, right? I feel like you yeah. would know that, where he says if you're, everyone's performing all the time and you don't have to perform, like you can just be a human. Just exist, like don't tie your self-worth to social media. It's, it's a big thing. And like, that, this isn't just a thing as creators and performers or celebrities. Literally everyone in this room has a Twitter or an Instagram or a YouTube channel or Facebook or something. And just what social media does to us is just, you know, insane the amount that it affects our mental health. And I'd be quite interested actually to know like what social media platform you think stresses you out the most? Because this is something probably that... Instagram, right? For you, okay. I mean, probably. Who here would say Instagram is the thing that when they check it, it stresses them out the most? Okay. okay. What okay, about Twitter? Anyone? Okay, Twitter, right. Twitter, really? I love Twitter. Tumblr, anybody? Oh, the discourse. Yeah, really. <laughs> Facebook. Anyone? Anyway, get out. 
no. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Thank yeah, you. Uh, but no, it's so interesting. Like, because Instagram has that whole aspect of look at all these beautiful, perfect people with their perfect lives. Yeah. They're doing such fun things, and they look so great. Twitter is everybody being so angry and political. Yeah. They're so clever. They're so like when I go onto Twitter. Because of what I do and what I like, I only follow people that are like politicians or comedians. So I go on and it's, the world is on fire. Also, I'm smarter and funnier than you. So it's, you know, yeah. that thing, it's very tiring. Um, and you so just have to learn to when to What about YouTube? Take a break. Well, what, no. Does YouTube scare anyone? Oh, oh well, yeah. I'm sure. But I'm like three people. Are you guys like, how many of you in this audience are like creators who want to be YouTubers? And how many of you are just, see, that's what, what when you were asking that question, it like gave me chills because I, freak out about Instagram and Twitter because it's my job. Yeah. I don't know why the fuck you guys are freaking out about Instagram and Twitter. That is upsetting. <laughs> it's just that constant comparison, isn't it? Yeah. It's just having everybody's, you know, because it's curating this image of perfection. That's why, like, I enjoy the, the kind of voice of my creativity, like my whole comedy is just, here's every flaw that I have, that's the joke, because I just I think it's so important to, and this is just the conversation about mental health, it's don't pretend everything's perfect all the time. If you talk about your vulnerabilities, people will actually like it, because it's so refreshing for someone else to just say, I'm having a bad day, this is stressing me out, this is making me anxious, because the other person will go, oh my god, me too, I thought I was the only one, and it's like, you know, no. We're all a mess. Well, I, 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 so I'm, I'm probably the oldest person on this panel. I'm 32. I grew up before social media. Um, thank you for the five <laughs> or six people that clapped. Um, there's also the idea that you don't have to share yourself online to prove that you exist. Um, I'm so grateful that there was no social media my entire adolescence. I'm so happy that party invites to friends' houses never had likes and you could never see who was invited and who wasn't. I'm so, so grateful for that. And so the idea that you don't get to live your life without sharing your life experience is truly toxic. And historically, if you look at art, art reflects the mood, attitude, energy of the society at the time. So if we, as people that are creating the new wave of art in our generation, are having nervous breakdowns from executing it, do not follow those steps. Why do that? If, you know, it, it, you don't need to value your worth by the numbers. And no matter how many times we drive that home, we as a society are all starting to value our worth by the numbers. And I really hope, I hope that bubble bursts. I really do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Last question, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, have you ever been in a situation where a friend was there for you during a time when you were struggling? Um, and what, what, what did that feel like? What did they do that really helped you through it? Um, Can I? Please. Because <laughs> this, I, listen, okay, sorry, I talk so much. I'm so narcissistic. I'm a YouTuber. Nice to meet you. <laughs> but this is important. Listen, guys, everything I say is so important. <laughs> No, but this was such an important thing. I posted this on Instagram, too, because, like I said, I was in a really, really dark place. We all get it. YouTubers go in dark places. But I still, at 28 years old, or 27 years old, how old am I? How old are you? 28. Okay, I'm 20. I'm 28. Okay, I knew that. <laughs> I knew we were the same age. We did it. That's not weird. Um, no, my friend Taylor, who is my best friend in the world, and she's always there for me, but this is a, a good example of... It's really lovely to ask people all the time, are you okay? How are you feeling? And it's, don't rely on that because my best friend in the world didn't think to ever ask me that. And I finally said something to her, I think sometime last year where I said, I think I wanna go to like a retreat or something. And she was like, oh, I'll come. And I said, no, I think I need to like be watched. Like I don't feel safe like being alone. And because I said that to her, she was like, oh, you're not okay. And then from that moment, like, She's always a great friend, but it was sort of like she would cancel plans not knowing that it was affecting me so deeply because to her, it was just like, oh, totally, I forgot, I'm flighty, whatever. And then I'd be like, fuck, nobody cares about me because that's how I was feeling at the time. So because I opened up to her and was like super vulnerable and really let her know how deep it had gotten, she was literally like, you're sleeping over tonight. And then I wake up to text and she's just like, what are you doing? We're getting coffee. And she was there for me, like stuck, like glue to my side. And that is what pulled me out of my hole is the moment that I finally said, I'm really not fucking okay. And now I'm surrounded with her and like my best friend Irene, who is like 
always there for me. And you just have to find those people who genuinely care about you, who you feel okay enough to say, I don't feel okay right now, and then ask them in return because then everybody's in a safe zone and you are never alone. And I know it might feel like you're alone right now because high school sucks and people aren't the best, but again, just keep holding on for that tomorrow because it always turns around. I love that quote that... <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> uh, sorry, just you saying that reminded me. M one of my favorite quotes is, tomorrow could be the someday you've been waiting for. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, for me, um, when, when I was going through that whole like mental breakdown thing, burnout last year, um, it was very like, YouTube related. And it's something that my hometown friends and family and friends back home didn't understand. Um, and so um, it was not that they were looking d down on me. It was more li like they just couldn't, they didn't know how to help. And so um, I had a, my friend Jody. Um, she like reached out to me. Yeah, she's great. Um, I, right after I posted that whole mental breakdown thing, um, she reached out because I was like, my mom was like on me, like, you know, me following me around. Uh, understandably, she was so worried, but like always on the verge of tears, and I just couldn't be around people who are pitying me. And so I flew out to London for a week as like a little retreat and hung out with her and, and her, her friends, and they're all also in the entertainment industry, and having people who understand and, and like are able to empathize rather than sympathize is that the right words yeah. yes okay good um th it was really nice and um kind of stuck out she like stuck with me the whole month and that was like honestly the best thing that happened yeah i think it's really important to, yeah <laughs> Woo. Yay. i think it's just really i mean as, as gabby said and as Elle said is like <clears throat> I think you need to just, you need to know yourself really well. And if you can start to kind of like look at different scenarios and really just take a step back for a second and like be like, okay, like how am I really feeling? Like, have I just kind of been like going through life on, you know, autopilot? Like, look at life and be like, what, how has it been going for me? So that you can kind of take a moment to realize for yourself how you're doing because you can't really always rely on someone to ask you. And if you are someone who does, you know, like to ask that is great it is great it's a great thing to do and you know all of my friends and my friend group were always checking on each other but it really took for my friends to really like kick in and, and really start doing as much as they could for me to just tell them like guys I have not been okay like it has not been okay this last year like this has been a bad year and that's when you kind of like start to find you know that support but I think it's important to not rely on that to just start to understand yourself be nicer to yourself and then take notes and be like, okay, whoa, like, this is how it feels when I'm not doing okay, and I should probably, you know, tell someone about this, because it is important to make sure you tell someone. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. Yes. Um, there are great tools and tips and tricks if you're someone that doesn't know how to even start that conversation to communicate. Uh, something that I found so helpful is that you can tell people how to ask you questions. Because if someone says to me, how are you feeling? I'm like, fine. Fine. Yeah, but if someone says, what are you thinking about? I'm like, I'm thinking, and I can answer it. But it's are you like, ready? Here we go, thinking. Yeah, <laughs> but like, but, and other people are different. It's like, so what are you thinking about? Some people are like, nothing really. How are you feeling? Terrible. But like, it just depends. These words, they all have meanings, and those meanings apply different things to different people. And so once you know what opens up your door of communication, you can take that piece of information and give it to someone that you love and say, hey, this is what I need you to ask when to check in with me. Because I, I won't know how to tell you how I'm feeling, but I can tell you what I'm thinking about. Or My friends like to use, um, how's your heart today? Aww. And then that's, that's a good indicator. Dead. <laughs> Surrounded by cholesterol. I like to say, how's the void? <laughs> Gaping, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, I also want to say as well, this being like an internet like festival thing that we're at today, like. If you're an online friend of someone too, that's just as valid and you can be just as helpful because sometimes people like, oh, I don't know anyone at my school. You know, I can't talk to people in this certain environment. Like if you're like, oh, there's no one at my church I could talk to about this. You know, there's so many environments where real life might not provide you the kind of communication you need from people. I had a friend that I spoke to on Messenger when I was a teenager and she was like, this is when we were all like emos. So everyone was like, we're all totally bisexual. Woo! And it was a good time. But like literally just having like this one girl to talk to, I was like, I'm literally not alone in the universe just having that person. And 
we don't speak anymore. We drifted after like you know a year or whatever. But it's just that thing where at the time I couldn't understate the impact or just how important it was to me. Like none of you, no, t not to put pressure on you, but like all the people that you're in group chats with, the people you came here today, you know those people in the K-pop DM things that you're on. <laughs> it's like. You might be someone's, no pressure, not lifeline, but just that thing that makes them feel less alone, that they have someone to talk to, that they can share their feelings. So like me and this one girl, and we were like, I just added her on MySpace, and we didn't even know each other or live in the same country. But it's that little bit of human contact, a little bit of empathy, someone just talking to you that can make you feel like you're not alone in a dark place. So you know, always feel like every time you talk to someone, you are being there for someone. I think it's important, too, to like learn how to ask your friends if they're okay. I feel like, you know, the opposite side of things, really just to like, you know, like my girlfriend, like I have to ask her multiple times, what's going on? Like, what are you thinking about? Because she needs to be asked a couple times before she's really gonna get into it. But like each person has like a different way that they're gonna be willing to communicate. And I think just from the opposite side of like telling someone how to ask you questions, it could be as easy as like, how do I like check on you? Like what, what's like the right way to say it to you? Just like, so you know, but just make sure that like, both sides of communication are open. And straight up, those conversations are easier to have when you're not in the moment. Literally, on the drive down, me and my fiance were driving down, and I was, I get really like in my head before this stuff. And I'm just like silent driving to Anaheim. And she's like, You seem tense. And for me, someone declaring how I feel shuts me off. No way I'm gonna talk about that. After when I am out of that moment, then I can be like, hey, babe, I think telling me I'm tense is not helpful for me. I don't know how to communicate, blah, 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 blah. If I'm in the moment, I can't be like, you know, that wasn't helpful. <laughs> it's not going to come out like That's that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, sometimes people aren't ready to talk, and you just have to come back to them. Like, you can't get offended if you say, like, how are you? And they go, I don't want to talk right now. Fine, then. You yeah. know, sometimes it's like we all get in a bad mood, and it, like being a good friend is sometimes accepting that someone could be angry, someone could be sad, someone could act like they're not ready to be helped. But as long as you're still there for them when they're ready, I think that's important. And, and that was what meant so much to me because she said she was like, "I how do I want to be there for you when you feel like this?" And then I get to say, "I don't know how to let you there. I don't know what to do. I'm barely learning how to take care of it myself." You know, but that's that's communication, which is the goal. Yeah, that's amazing. Check in on your friends, I think is what we're all saying too. And yeah. like, you could do it online, you could do it in person, via text. Um, if you are looking for tips, like Hannah was saying, check out seizetheawkward.org or look up Seize the Awkward on Instagram. Um, we have a question from the audience. Danny asks, how do I improve my self-confidence? Asking the wrong group. <laughs> yeah, right. A bunch of people who are like professionally awkward. We're all yeah, like, yeah, yeah, we're professionally. Yeah, the I paid the someone to paint my face today so that I could feel comfortable being on a stage. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing for me, I mean, what helped me a lot, because I, I am someone who just terrible self confidence, man. Um, especially when you're putting your face on YouTube every week. Sometimes the biggest reason I don't want to film is because I'm like, damn, I am ugly this week. Like, I just don't want to film. Um, <laughs> It's, it's real. Um, I would just say, like, you know, one, stop comparing yourself to everyone. Two, I think just kind of, like, accept the fact that you're you and, like, you're, you're, you're a wonderful, beautiful person that looks nothing like anyone else. Like, it's special and, like, you don't want to, like, want to change that or hate that. Like, that's just being so mean to yourself. You know, you're selfish. You're trying your best, you know? And I think just, you know, be easy on yourself, and I think it'll start to come more naturally. You'll start to find, like, you know, it's not, it's not the biggest deal in the world. I think you can, you can start to feel, if you just feel better about yourself, it all kind of comes in together. I think that taking care of yourself is really important, too, because for me, when I started feeling really confident and feeling sexy and cool and just comfortable was when I started working out all the time, and I realized it wasn't coming from the fact that my body was changing, because realistically, my, my body didn't change that much. But just feeling so strong and fit and taking that time out of every day where I was literally only focusing on me. When I'm at the gym, there's nothing else I'm worrying about except for bettering myself in that time. So take care of yourself. Take a break. Watch TV if you need to. Take a bath. Self-care is actually so important. And it's not about a physical thing. It's about how you feel. Like, my rolls are all over my Instagram now, baby. <laughs> I think it's exactly what you were saying as well, that it's so much about like just accepting who you are. 
Because for me, I was a silent, awkward teenager in so many situations, and I've become more confident. And a lot of that has just been to do with me letting go of all of these pressures that I felt from other people to be this thing and to act in this certain way that I wasn't. So I realized that so many of these negative feelings that I carried with me when I was younger were things that weren't actually a part of who I was in my life. There were these expectations that I was getting from social media and the world and people at school. And it's as I got older and went, that's not me. I'm never going to be that person that does this. I am this person. And then you go, hey, actually, I'm okay with the person that I am. I don't need to apologize. I don't need to change for these things. So when you love yourself, you'll get confident.